CWDS uh, seminar. Um, and uh, this seminar is part of the CWDS uh, AKAM, which is Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav series. And today we have uh, with us uh, our special guest speaker, who is Professor Maruna Murmu. Professor Murmu, thank you very much for uh, uh, you know, uh, joining us. Um, and thank you to all of you, of course, all the audience. Um, so uh, we welcome Professor Murmu. And let me give a brief introduction to her. Uh, professor Murmu is currently a professor of history at Jadavpur University. After her bachelor's degree from Presidency College in Calcutta, she received her MA and MPhil and PhD degrees from JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Her monograph entitled Words of Her Own, Women Authors in 19th Century Bengal was published by OUP. She has written a number of articles on gender studies in colonial India and the caste question in Bengal in journals and edited books. Apart from anti-caste activism, she engages in issues concerning Adivasis and the environment. And uh, today, uh, the title of Professor Murmu's talk is Women Authors and the Bengal Renaissance. So Professor Murmu, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, your library I visited, the library of CWDS, it's very rich. So when I was doing my research work, I've been there. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So uh, let me begin uh, the talk. So uh, I would uh, like to trace the growth of the social category of women authors in 19th century Bengal a period which is designated as uh, the Bengal Renaissance by the contemporaries uh, like Ramon Roy, Rabindranath Thakur, for uh, it witnessed sociocultural awakening and transformations in the mind and thought of educated elites of Bengal, popular, uh, popularly known as Badrulogs. Now, uh, the idea and the term Bengal Renaissance has been rooted in the attitude of people of the period towards their own time and in their thinking and feeling about the changing reality that they were embedded in. In a conversation with Scottish Presbyterian missionary Alexander Duff, Ramon Roy said, I began to think that some similar to European Renaissance might have taken place here in India. So, and we have Bhankam Chandra Chattopadhyay, Rabindranath Tagore, they are called the times as one of Renaissance and uh, regeneration. And it is, I'm saying things very simplistically, and it is assumed that uh, Bengal reformers fought against different forms of social alienation like legal discrimination, poverty, caste, and gender inequality for a worthy life of the populace. Now, uh, sex belonging to the genre of uh, tracts, autobiographies, diaries, novels, and travel writings produced by Hindu and Brahmin women. And these would be read within a specific sociocultural and ideological milieu to explore how women varied from one another in their literary representations within and across genres. Against the general notion of marginalization and silencing of women's narratives in dominant literary discourses and conventional history writing, this talk probes the stratagems of survival that enabled women authors to negotiate with male dominated literary arenas. So, uh, these writings by women can be read as ways of self understanding and empowerment in contrast to their Bhadralok counterparts who were endowed with authoritative and history-making agency in Renaissance and Bengal. Now between 1850 to 1900, we find that about 300 books were offered by Hindu and Brahmo women in Bengali, and they have been officially listed under the categories of art, biography, drama, fiction, history, language, poetry, philosophy, religion, science, and travel in the Bengal Library catalog of books, uh, the quarterly appendix to the Calcutta Gazette. 
Now, during the same period, we find that 15 periodicals were devoted to women's issues and they were edited by women. Women even appeared as literary critiques in certain journals. And if we look at a quantitative analysis of uh, literary critics, we find that women mostly wrote poetry followed by novels, dramas, discursive essays. Now, what led to the emergence of women authors as a distinct, continuous, and ever-going category for the first time uh, during Renaissance Bengal? Now, uh, we all know that in 19th century, uh, the social cultural identity and respectability of the Potrolo and the Potro Mohila was constructed through literature. Bengal being the first seat of vernacular press and print culture, we find that uh, now the the authored by women, uh, they ran something to between one thousand to two thousand. Now, uh, Man Kumari Boshu's book, Bangali Romani Diger Bhutharmo, which was written in 1890, and Shorla Kumari Devi's called Bushal Fortune in 1894, had a press run of 5,000, indicating a proof of readership uh, and a market for books written by women. Now, if multiple editions and reprints are taken to be uh, indicators of an author's popularity, then Shonu Kumari Devi and Girinda Mohani Dashi emerged as the most reputed women authors during the period. Now, if one looks at the price list, uh, we find that uh, one does not find a clear indication of disparity in price of books based on gender. So uh, if we find uh, let me take up somebody who is quite popular. So in 1894, if we took up uh, Rabindranath Tagore's play Rajorshi, so that fetched a rupee and four runners. So did his sister Shona Kumari Devi's novel, Deep Nirvan. Now, uh, uh, what I'll do at the, after uh, looking at various texts, what I'll do at the end would be to look at the sort of reception of the uh, various genres that women ventured into. I'll begin with uh, discursive tracts. Now, uh, I take up discursive tracts because uh, household was perceived as the embryonic nation and the ideal nationalist household was overwhelmingly overwhelmingly imagined to be a big one. Now, uh, women negotiated with didactic prescriptions and they were critical about the exploitative structures of power embedded in the hegemonic ideology of Hindu domesticity. I just discussed two texts, Koilash uh, Vashini Devi's Hindu Mohila Gandhar Hina Vastar, Miseries of Hindu Women, and Shona Kumari Gupta's Usha Chinta or Thad Adunik Arjo Mohilar Avastha Shamunde Kwaiti Kotha or Thoughts at the Break of It All, A Few Words and the Condition of Modern Aryan Women. Now, in keeping with the project of creating a modern patriotic subjects through literature, Kuyash uh, Vashini Devi adopts a civilizing come nationalist critique of the society mores with a linear trajectory of progress. On the other hand, Shorna Moigupto, she seeks to reestablish Aryan societal order, uh, saying that uh, women in the past had a comfortable life and uh, that should be reanimated in colonial Bengal. So what we find in this tracts is that they do not deal with idealized Hotramohila existence and the desirable domesticity, but they talk about women's actual living condition and their status in the 
colonial patriarchal setup. Now I'll take up the first text, uh, which was written in 1863, Miseries of Hindu Women. Uh, this was published by uh, Kulash Vashini's husband, Durga Charu Bhukto, who ran, uh, who ran the press that uh, published the famous Hindu almanacs, Gupta Press, Kojika. It's still there. Now, uh, right at the preface of the book, she apologizes for forced assertion of identity in print because uh, invisibility of women was the norm. So uh, having entered the public realm of print culture as a writing subject and uh, constructing the Hindu women as textu uh, textual object, she is apologetic about the breach of the uh, fundamental norm of invisibility of women in public realm. Now, uh, she sees that it was a husband who compelled her to gain access to the male preserve of learning uh, at the age of 12. And it is he who uh, insisted that she wrote this book. Now, in the advertisement, we find uh, Koyrash Pashini Devi profusely thanking uh, Bama Shundari Devi, who was her inspiration. Uh, Bama Shundari of Pavna, she wrote the first Bengali discursive tract in 1861. And this tract, uh, in this, she dealt with domestic management, behavior with relatives, rearing and education of children. Uh, she's critical about women's illiteracy, hyg unhygienic labor rooms, misinformed child care, events of early marriage, uh, couldn't polygamy, deprivation of child widow, uh, about caste injunctions. I find that some of the concerns, almost of the concerns of Bama Shundri Devi are replicated by Koylash Vashini Devi. Now, Koyalash uh, Prashnidevi commences with the condemnation of indigenous social customs and practices, which she thinks are the root causes for miseries of women. Uh, she compares the abominable condition of Indian women to their counterparts in civilized nation. And she says that national regeneration could only happen through enlightened participation and regeneration of nationalist consciousness in the daughters of Mother Bengal. Now, uh, she disapproves of sufferings and deprivations that begin at the birth of the girl child, starting with the uh, Thai or uh, Thai being paid half the price if the child was a, a girl child. Now, she talks about uh, women being married off at an early age, uh, they being devoid of education, and she questions uh, the particular uh, patriarchal anxieties around uh, education. And she writes, we don't on account of education, can the might of knowledge kill a husband and deprive a woman of the apple of her eye? Is learning such a vile thing that associating with it makes a woman, woman fall into evil ways? In what ways? Would she be independent, seeing that she falls from honor the moment she steps out of the court world? Now, she's the one who talks about uh, sartorial reform. Uh, she also talks against the evils of caste system, singling it out to be one of the obstacles, uh, major obstacle in the path of social happiness, economic prosperity, political unity. Uh, she talks against uh, the injunction uh, put against uh, traveling Hindus. Uh, now, uh, she problematizes uh, loveless conjugality and the tyranny of child marriage. She says that uh, child marriage is one of the prime reasons for the wretched condition of women. And she dies, writes, where no work can be executed without love, how can there be marital bliss out of lovelessness? Nuptial love is on the verge of extinction in our country. True love in a married couple is rarely observed. 
the partners are uncaring towards each other's sentiments and unwilling to voice their own desires. How can women be expected to be devotionally attached to their husbands then? She goes on to prescribe the age of marriage for boys to 20 and for girls 13 and 14, something which was argued much later in 1929 uh, Sarda Act or Child Marriage Restraint Act. Now, Kulash uh, Mashini deals at great length with the customs and moves of uh, colonialism, uh, enforced sexual repression of Pulin women. Uh, she also narrates unbearable sufferings of celibate widow and her uh, vulnerability. And uh, she blames the uh, Hindu religion, saying, Hin Hail Hinduism, thank to you, uh, thanks to you, and also to the glorious one that created you. It is the widow who knows what fruits this religion has borne. Oh God, uh, oh God alone knows where the grandness of this religion lies. Oh, you friends who think good of the country, be enterprising enough to come to the rescue of these women. We move on to the next text, which talks about uh, Shastric injunctions. Uh, and Shonamoy uh, Gupta, she thinks that upliftment of women could only come through uh, efforts by uh, Hindu revivalists who would follow Shastric injunctions uh, so that the Hindu society of the Aryan past would be rejuvenated. Now, like most revivalist nationalists like Mumkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, she took up the responsibility of reworking indigenous uh, history of retrieval of self-respect. Uh, now, she did not uh, desire a future designed according to a modernizing project, which would entail protective intervention of the colonial state, uh, progress and betterment to her meant initiative of indigenous patriarchy. Now, uh, she talks about uh, absence of uh, canonized women uh, of the Puranas, local legends, recorded history, myths in uh, colonial Bengal and uh, in order to create the ideal Hindu man and Hindu woman she uh, transcends spatio-temporal and cultural boundaries while she talks about uh, ancient women like Gargi, Khona, Ilabuti. Uh, she goes on to talk about American women in general about the ferocious goddess uh, Pavani of the Kutfio queens like Kshatriya queens like uh, Rani Durgaputi, Rani Kamala Bhuti. Uh, she also talks about uh, Hindu uh, other Shaktis responsible for cosmic existence like Lakshmi and Saraswati. And uh, talking about men, she talks about uh, Kartu Bijajun, Damodagni, and historical figures as well as uh, like Rana Pratap. And she says that unless uh, mothers contribute to the process of nation making, affecting the quality of future citizens, it will not be possible to ensure the regeneration of the nation. Now, uh, she says that uh, there is a revolution in the Hindu society. Women, and she pleads that justice nationalists have revolted uh, against indigo farmers, Kilis in Assam. They ought to fight for the cause of subjugated women of the nation. Uh, with a strain of communal thinking, she ascribes the uh, degraded condition of Hindu women to Muslim invasion, uh, which she thinks required uh, imposition of. Uh, stricter rules of modesty. Uh, nonetheless, uh, she admonishes colonial men for continuing such rigorous surveillance when it was no longer necessary. 
Uh, now, uh, social customs pertaining to conjugality, uh, conjugality uh, remains an area of major concern for Shonomohi. And uh, she again uh, says that when the daughter reaches the age of 10, she becomes such a burden to the considerate parents that they consign their daughter to seek a sick, maimed, infirm uh, being. And uh, they are content with this ritual sacrifice. And once again, like Kuilaj Bashini, she says, hail Hindu society, hail Hindu religion. Oh Lord, you are praiseworthy too. Even after witnessing such barbarity, you do not refrain from offering food to the Hindus. Uh, uh, she talks about the uh, abominable custom of uh, colonialism. She, she says that uh, just like women are expected to be otibrutas, uh, there should be equal responsibility from the husband to make the marriage workable. Uh, and she goes on to say that uh, the husband should be equally committed to make the household a blissful one. Now, uh, let us move on to the, uh, I'm hurrying through, uh, let, uh, to the next genre that I'm going to talk about, that's uh, autobiography. And I'll talk about a diary written by Kulash Vashini Mitro, which is called uh, John Oko Grihobadu Diary, which is arguably, uh, arguably the only diary maintained in 19th century Bengal, and uh, another dictated autobiography by Sharada Shundari uh, Devi. Now, uh, Koilash Vashini Devi's uh, John Oko Grihobadu Diary, or a diary of a certain housewife, uh, covers the time span 1846 to 1873. Now, uh, belonging, she belonged to uh, a progressive family of Bengal. Uh, her husband, Kishore Chad Mitro, was the first district magistrate of Kolkata. And uh, her personal reminiscence of the diary elucidates how contemporary historical circumstances, social institutions, and cultural agendas conditioned her thoughts, feelings, and the life uh, she lived. Personal conflicts with her husband on religious and social issues reflect in microcosm social drama, which was being enacted in the larger social cultural macrocosm. Uh, she released the me mechanism by which 19th century society was changing and its effects not only on the age, but also on individuals who seem to fill the pages of Renaissance Bengal. Now, uh, Kishore Chad uh, took the decision of taking his wife with him to places where he was posted. And that is why uh, we find Kulesh Vashini blessed with life, which had novelty. So her uh, diary is much like a travelogue, scripting her own journey of self-discovery through places she visited. Now, uh, in the diary, Kulesh Vashini fashions herself as an ideal Bhotra Mohila, uh, who could uh, participate in re refined discussion with her husband, uh, exhibited cultural refinement, was an educated mother. Uh, she goes on to write that her husband uh, taught her English at night and a European lady, Miss Tigot, was hired for a salary of uh, rupees 25 a month to uh, teach her and uh, throughout the diary, she talks about uh, texts like Robinson Crusoe, Bokim Chandra Chattopadhyay's Miranini. And now one of the important themes in the diary is her evolving relationship with her husband, the sort of protection, the security and comfort that she found in her marriage with uh, Kishori Chad Mitro, which was quite unusual uh, in 19th century. And in the diary, we find uh, candid expressions of mutual compassion and care. Uh, at the same time, uh, she was aware that uh, these women were uh, 
uh, limited to female solidarity and sisterhood because they were not allowed to socialize. Um, now, uh, I'll, I'll just talk of one instance where uh, we can see that the life she led was quite different. Uh, on one of the occasions, she died that she was very ill and uh, the daughter's married, marriage had to be um, conducted but Kishori Chad said that uh, the daughter could be married only after recovery. Kurdish Rashni snapped back, saying that it would be fine if you married Kumudini to a Shahib, and he himself married a Mem Shahib. And we find in a dramatic passage, Kishori Chad uh, retorting that uh, he has never neglected her and that she shouldn't be uh, saying such things about him. And Kulash Pashini responds to this declaration of love with sharp wit, saying that she has never been neglected simply because she has never done anything that deserves to be chastised. Now, uh, the social reform movement uh, made Kishori Chad uh, adapt to a life that was not agreeable to uh, Kailash Bashani Devi when he came to Kolkata as the uh, chief deputy magistrate. Uh, he became acquainted with the radical fears of young Bengal and he started drinking uh, and he adapted westernized lifestyle. Uh, he also uh, started uh, moving away from Hindu rituals. Now, uh, Kailash Pashini sees that uh, she is not convinced about the uh, basic validity of Hindu ritual, but she sticks to them because uh, a woman's identity is relational in terms of her uh, association with family, clan, caste, community, and um, fear of excommunication actually uh, enforced conformism so far as a woman is concerned. And now uh, she says that with the Sepoy mutiny, uh, days of their happiness ended, uh, Kishore Richard was removed from his post because uh, he had heard the pride of the colonial government and he spearheaded the Black Act meeting now, Kulash uh, Vashini remained silent about uh, Kishore Richard after he was removed from his service. And uh, next that she writes about Kishore Richard is about his death on 6th August, 1873, after severe illness of six months. Now, uh, beginning her record with the death of a son in 1846, Kulash Vashini abruptly ends her narrative with the death of her husband. Uh, she uh, turns reticent about 32 remaining years of her existence as a helpless Hindu widow. Now, while uh, widowhood ended the meaning of life for somebody like Willash Bashan Devi, uh, the next person that I'm going to deal with, Sharada Shundari Devi, uh, thought that the independence that widowhood gave to her allowed her to uh, lead a exemplary life. Now, Haratu uh, Katha, or my story, was dictated to her grandson-in-law, Jogindralal Khastogin, and she started dictating the story of life in 1892 when she claimed she was 73, and she completes it when, uh, in 1900. Now, um, since women were thought to be without attention roles, Jogindra Lal Khastogil uh, perceives this life story as that of uh, the mother of a Brahma minister. Uh, now, uh, Sharada Shundari was the mother of Keshav Chandra Sen. So Jogindra Lal aims to present a public image of Keshav Chandra through the private words of his mother. Now, this is 
contrary to the narrative purpose that Sharuga Chunduri chose herself, Being the mother of Keshav Chandra was one of the many roles she played. And uh, Keshav Chandra is not the pivot of her mother's self imagining. Now, uh, Jogandra uh, says that the life would have come out better had Sharada Shundari not abstained from recording many painful incidents. Uh, now we should uh, understand that truth and authenticity are culture, cultural constructions and uh, feminine attributes like shame, modesty, uh, fear of contempt from posterity restrained Sharada Shundari's tale to tell on. So uh, suffering in silence out of heartfulness for others being construed as a virtue for women uh, we find that Sharada Shundari selectively remembers certain experiences and conveniently raises others. Uh, now, uh, uh, the fragmentary pattern of narration is worth mentioning. Uh, between uh, 22nd June 1892 to 17th November 1892, in the ninth sessions, she deals with her natal and marital, marital life, her children. Uh, Lubin Chandru, Kishab Chandru, Krishna Bihari, her daughters, Brudishuri, Kuleshuri, Chuni, Panna, uh, her widowhood, her pilgrimages to Ganga Shagur, Puri, Kashi, Prayag, Vrindavan, Mathura, Vidyachal, uh, the marriage of the three daughters, the loss of her husband, mother in law. Surprisingly, she resumes the narration after seven years, nine months on August 1900. And on a single day, she covers uh, a huge vista like that's in the family, her relationship with uh, sons, daughters, daughters in law, granddaughters in law, uh, death of Keshav Chandra Sen, uh, marriage, uh, sorry, a division of uh, property, the uh, controversial Kujbihar marriage of her granddaughter, Shuniti Devi, that brought about a schism in Brahma Shava. Now, uh, conventionally, we find that uh, the autobiographical self is introduced through patrilineal genealogy, uh, intricacies of kinship network, affiliations of caste and clan. But Sharada Shindri devotes just a dozen sentences about her origin. Uh, she talks about her birth uh, in 1819 at her ma maternal uncle's place and not very much about her family. Now, uh, there might be a number of reasons why she chose to uh, begin writing about her life at the juncture of disruption, uh, her married life. Now, early marriage made the span of uh, childhood shorter for women in 19th century, leaving a very few pleasurable me memories of pre-pubertal, untroubled world. Uh, other could be that bereft of parental or matrimonial right to land, in, uh, land inheritance, uh, the privileges, power that come with class, caste. Uh, Sharada Shundari might have thought it proper not to claim an identity uh, through those structures. Uh, relegation of the nat natal family also comes hand in hand with the social injunction that a uh, woman's real affiliation is not with the natal family but with the matrimonial one. Now, uh, fear and anxiety as a child bride truly begins her recollection, and she sees how her grand, uh, sorry, how her mother-in-law did not uh, took an instant dislike towards her. her and uh, made her father-in-law him. But we find uh, uh, quite a bit about her father-in-law, Ram Komal Sheen. Uh, only, it is only after the death of her husband, Pyari Mohan Sheen, that uh, she writes a very small section on uh, commendable attributes of her husband the fact that he was a deeply religious Vaishnav, 
He was a good looking man. Uh, he was a man of few words. He was exceptionally charitable, uh, that he got a gold medal in the examination from Hindu college, that he was good in English, Bengali, Sanskrit, Persian. He was skillful in playing a number of musical instruments like harmonium, bakwa, sitar, esraj. And she also said that uh, he made her to write, but uh, through disuse, she has forgotten how to write. Now, the absence of her husband uh, made her position vulnerable in the joint family. Uh, we know that under the Daibhav system of property in Bengal, widowed women had no right over the husband's uh, land. So she withdrew from family matters. Uh, so uh, what she talks about at great length are the pilgrimages that she took and various marriage negotiations within the family. And she says that the only marriage negotiation where her voice was not stifled was that of the youngest daughter, Padna, in 1853. She says that uh, her choice of bride for Keshav Chandra Sen was thwarted twice by her brother-in-law. And she uh, spent quite a few lines to express how displeased she was uh, when Keshav Chandra was married to eight-year-old uh, Jogo Mohini of Bali in 1856. Uh, but uh, we find that uh, Sharada Shundari welcomed a girl from a lower clan. Uh, th those are her words. Uh, when the marriage of Kish uh, Krishna Bihari was conducted, she said that this was a marriage of a new kind, love marriage. And uh, we find that uh, she initiated the new bride into the Brahmo faith in 1869. She also talks about uh, the marriage of her granddaughter, uh, Moharani Shuniti, who was married to the 21st Maharaja of Kujbihar. Maharaja Nupandunaran uh, Bhub Bahadur, the marriage which led to the uh, schism in Brahmo Shamaj because it was believed that Shuniti was below 15 uh, and the orthodox Hindu Maharaja was just 15. Now, uh, either out of a conscious subversive strategy for manipulation of facts or as an evasive mechanism against discoverable memories, we find that. Uh, she refuses to write further about the marriage, saying many have written about it. Uh, there is no need to repeat it. I'm going very slowly, so I, I'll try to uh, wrap up things and I'll not deal with much here. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go on to the uh, novels. Uh, now, uh, the early novels written by uh, women turned their gaze to patriarchal Bengali society to empathize with women's plight. Uh, almost all female protagonists were inmates of Ondoku. They were subjected to multiple sufferings, inequalities, and injustices uh, stemmed out of child marriage, colonialism, adultery, sexual excess of their husband. Um, so most of the accounts, uh, the uh, protagonists, uh, were deprived, they indulged in self-sacrificial acts, uh, and they have similar endings like the protagonist committing suicide, facing death, embracing Chotipo, or leading a dissatisfied life. As against all this, I'm going to take up uh, one novel uh, that is uh, by Shornukumari Devi, who belonged to the uh, enlightened Tagore family. Now, Shorna Kumari was a prolific writer. She wrote 11 uh, novels. Uh, she was a versatile genius. She was a poet, a playwright, an essayist, a songwriter, a journalist. And uh, I'll take, I'll talk about her novel, Kahaki. Uh, now, uh, the novel opens with a quote from Canto One of Lord Byron's poem, Don Juan, uh, and begins with the line, man's love is of man's thing apart, 
It is the woman's whole existence. Now, uh, the protagonist, Milalini, uh, writes in the first person, saying that the person who wrote these lines was a man. When I consider my own life, I feel this to be literally proved. If I detach love from myself, life becomes empty and without substance. I lose myself. But at again, uh, as against the societal paradigm of the unique once-in-a-lifetime relationship of love, she confesses that she loved even before her marriage without the thought of getting married to that person. Uh, and then she says that she shifted from that person to another person. Uh, and uh, now, uh, only a daring female subject could spell out thus at a time when uh, women were seen to construct it to be uh, epitomes of monogamous love. No, uh, she says that uh, when she was in school, she fell in love with the eldest people in her class, Chotu. And uh, she pondered where, whether Chotu loved her as much as her father, because while her father kissed her, Chotu uh, did, not, did not. Now, uh, the much wanted respectability of a woman was associated with sexual self. So writing thus uh, was obviously exceptional. Now, uh, she constructs. Uh, Westernized liberal from who household Hunanini, uh, where badminton matches and parties were held, and it is in this atmosphere of free mixing that she comes in touch with a barrister, Mr. Ramanath Ghosh, and uh, she thought that she'll be married to this man when she overhears a conversation between uh, Doctor Vinoy Kumar Bose and this Mr. Ramanath Ghosh, uh, and. Vinay Kumar, this doctor, uh, chides uh, Ramanath Ghosh, saying that he was engaged to some Miss K in England. Uh, now, with uh, moral corruptibility creeping into her soul's chosen love, Rinalini no longer perceives marriage as an institution that completes a woman, uh, problem problematizing patriarchy desire for monopolistic claim over woman's love, she demands fidelity from men too. And she writes, the man who is the object of my forgiveness can never be my lover, my husband. Just as a man desires eternal, untarnished purity from his wife, yearns everlasting devotion, I too want to possess his entire existence as mine. I can pardon him. I can even marry him if need be but he can never enter the sanctuary of my being. Will such a manly feeling in a woman be treated with compassion? But uh, things happen, uh, she grows closer to Dr. Uh, Bosch, but it uh, so, so happens that uh, this Dr. Bosch uh, is, uh, his marriage is fixed to somebody else. Now, meanwhile, Mirani's father, arrives here to verify the uh, rumor whether uh, Minalini has actually broken off her engagement with uh, Dr. Uh, with Mr. Ramanath Ghosh, the barrister. Uh, it so happens that the father decides to get uh, Minalini married to a man of his choice. And it so happens that the man chosen by uh, her father is the very same Chuttu of the childhood. Uh, days. So the past is recuperated within the present as the center of childhood affection becomes the passionate love of youth. Uh, and in an interrogative tone, she asks the reader, reader uh, Kahake means to whom? So uh, she asks the reader, did my heart get attracted to the new, finding the semblance of the old in it? Or is it being charmed by the new I have attained the old? To whom have I restored my love? Now, uh, what is very interesting about this uh, novel is that uh, 
in a decisive novelistic moment, there's a forced discussion regarding the societal role of a novelist. Uh, there's a discussion whether George Eliot is better than uh, William Shakespeare. And uh, while, the, while her brother-in-law thinks that George Eliot is better than uh, William Shakespeare, the doctor thinks otherwise. Now, uh, one ought not look for exact parallels between life and work, but Shornu Kumari, this might be a reconstruction of the sort of comparison that Shornu Kumari suffered with her younger brother, Rubindranath uh, Tagore. Now, in 1813, soon after Kahake was translated and published by her as Unfinished Song, the much liberal Rabindranath wrote a letter to William Rothenstein, the publisher, saying she's one of those unfortunate beings who has more ambition than nobility, just enough talent to keep her alive for a short period. Her weakness has been taken advantage of by some unscrupulous literary agents in London, and she has had stories translated and published. I have given her no encouragement, but uh, have not been successful in making her see things in proper light. Now, this is heart-wrenching uh, to find her being treated disparagingly by Rovina Tagore when she had dedicated her first book of poem, Gatha, to her uh, younger sibling, Ruby. Now, um, since I want a bit of discussion, let me uh, move on to the reception of the text by, uh, written by women to see uh, how Renessa Bengal was open about uh, the writings of women. Now, since most of the women uh, violated Norms of uh, literariness that were set by the Bhutralok, we find the, that the reception of women authored texts uh, was uh, not very favorable. Uh, uh, let me take up uh, Shanukumari Devi's uh, novel, Dip Nirman. Uh, first one that she wrote, which was published in Cognito in 1876. Now, uh, curiously, the literary critic Oshikumar Bandhupadhyay, in his book published on the occasion of 125th birth anniversary of Rabindranath Tagore, observes, this woman novelist is easily comparable to any male novelist of a time in a narrative technique and creation of characters. However, her novels, her novels are rather virile and devoid of soft feminine touch. So uh, we see that a woman's creative imagination had to be harnessed to display womanly qualities. Let us take up another, take up another book, Shanukwari Devi's Chinnamukul, or The Nipped Bud, that was reviewed in the organ of the uh, Brahmo Shamaj in the mirror. And now the reviewer here writes, the style is, as is characteristics of this writer, chest, clear, sweet, and vigorous. Almost all characters are extremely natural, especially Kono, the heroine of the story. She is an admirable portrait of self-sacrifice and disappointed love. Instances of such grand women hero heroism and abnegation of self liberate the fancy and gladden the heart. So uh, once again, we see how homely qualities in the writer was expected uh, by the reviewers. Now, let me take up another text. Uh, this is called Nishpal Toru or Baron Tree, written by Torum Ginidashi. Uh, this was uh, this review was published in Calcutta Review, and let me read this. Uh, it says, "We are sorry to say that we have not found much in this work, which a woman alone could have given us." Srimati Tarumgini does not seem to speak from the heart. It is not a woman's language, and is owing, we fear, to the mischievous fascination exercised over youthful minds 
by a style of writing which now and then offends our tastes in the pages of the excellent periodical Bombudorshan. Srimuthi Torungini is really a promising writer and success is sure to crown her literary efforts if she only throws away all meretricious models of style set by persons who do not belong to her sex and seek a style in her own true woman's heart. Let me go on to the last uh, review. Uh, now, this review came out in uh, Bangladeshan, which was edited by the Doyen of Bengali literature, Bhogim Chandra Tattopadhyay, and he happens to review uh, Mukhudai Nemukhapadhyay's first collection of poem, Munukrushum. Now, uh, in this uh, text, there's a scathing attack on the Bengali Babu, uh, where Mukhudaini is sarcastic towards the emancipated Babu, who is vainglorious, slavish. Now, uh, this review needs to be quoted at length. Uh, quote, despite the use of the surname Mukhupadhyay, the readers must have understood that this work is not written by any Mr. Mukherjee, but Srimuthi Mukhudaini Devi. The epithet of Devi, which leaves goddesses like Shruti, Saraswati, and Lakshmi, leaves uh, Srimuthi Mukhubadhai discontent. We abstain from entering into an altercation. We do not intend to be a match for women in that field. I'm always afraid to praise poetic comp composition by women, since it might instigate other women to desert their household duties and take up the pen. I hope Srimoti Mukhudai Nimukhapadhai will condone me if I am not over generous in praising her work. Her poem, Bangalir Babu, has been published with some delusions. Hope the author would forgive such audacity. Now, uh, uh, I would argue that uh, sarcastic comments, gossip critique uh, does not strip women authors of Renaissance Bengal of their creative foray. Whatever be their contemporary receptivity, uh, it was their negotiation with discourses on literary worth, uh, their redeployment of traditional values and experimentation with possibilities that inspire us today to write this history of contestation. So uh, it was the literary foremothers resistance, subversion and, and even compromises uh, that we today proudly proclaim as a powerful and complex inheritance. Uh, sorry if I've overstepped my timing, but I uh, end here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Maruna. No, you didn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, you actually uh, could have taken some more time if you wished. Uh, but thank you very much for your presentation, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, so let me now open it up for um, others, the audience, to ask questions. Um, you can put it in the chat box or uh, ask directly. Uh, so while others are, uh, you know, making, uh, thinking about it, Maruna, can I ask you a question? Um, I just wanted to know, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so uh, are you saying that uh, the genres which you've talked about, um, uh, although, you know, they are contradictory in content because they uh, contain both uh, contestatory as well as, you know, um, collaborative kind of, or, you know, deferential um, narratives. Uh, would you say that, uh, you know, uh, 
the genre which you talked about uh, and several of them, they kind of challenged the Bengali Bhadra Lok and um, kind of gave a feminist edge to the Bengal Renaissance, or is that uh, too general a uh, conclusion? Yeah, uh, no, uh, they did uphold certain, uh, uh, what would I say, uh, patriarchal constructions regarding women's role in society, but one has to make a distinction between um, compliance and uh, manipulative strategy. They felt that whatever little they were allowed to speak would be taken away if they were very um, radical in their pronouncement. But having been, as I said, they in the beginning of the text, they were uh, very polite, saying that uh, we do not worthless being. Our observations are not perfect. But having said that, they went on to dismantle patriarchal constructions that talked about their own conditions, the pitiable condition that women wear in through very genres, be they autobiographies, novels, uh, or anything else. Even in travel writings, if you look at uh, the travel writings, they compare the condition of women here in Bengal and that in other parts of India as well as in England uh, to say how pitiable the condition of women is in Bengal and how the women of Bengal have to awaken themselves if the Babus, the Bengali Bhotrolok, do not come forward. So it's the daughters of Bengal who have to take charge. That's what uh, some of them urge. Thank you, others. Uh, okay, uh, I'd like to ask another question, Maruna. Uh, I was quite struck by what Rabindranath Tagore, you know, your little kind of story about that. Because, uh, um, of course, uh, one has read Tagore, but uh, there's a different gendered edge to your story. Uh, so, uh, what can, uh, what is a kind of uh, inference one might have? regarding that, because surely he was not a misogynist, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, it's a kind of clear uh, assertion of some patriarchal kind of uh, authority. So uh, just wanted to know what you think. Uh, actually, there was a debate uh, between Ramabai Ranade and Rabindranath Tagore about uh, spheres of uh, work like he believed that uh, literature is not the field, the creative field does not belong to women. So uh, they ought to concentrate at the home front. So there was a famous uh, letter that was written and uh, that was uh, taken up by Shona Kumari Devi uh, speaking in on behalf of Ramabai Ranade. So Rabindranath somewhat uh, maybe did not approve of uh, creative that women went into. Uh, maybe he did think that women were intelligent enough to write, I believe. And uh, her, uh, his sister was quite a competition. I think he couldn't take it. Okay, well, now I hope there'll be other questions uh, from the audience. Uh, there's one in the chat box, Maruna. Can you please uh, see it? Uh, what they said was that you need to dismantle the sort of like they talked about the necessity of uh, uh, breaking down caste commensality rules. Uh, they said uh, basically for the uh, necessity of 
uh, economic prosperity. They said that it's necessary that uh, Hindu men are allowed to go abroad. There's, uh, the restriction on Kalapani is broken down and uh, Hindu men are not made to expiate for their sin, quote unquote sin, if they cross the Kalapani, uh, things like that. They were talking about intercaste marriages as well. They felt in order to uh, bring about uh, unity, to bring about uh, national bondage, that is also necessary. So uh, this is quite uh, revolutionary for the times, because women speaking about su such things. And uh, we find the women making uh, fun of uh, even religious preceptors who said that uh, this is Sharada Shundari Devi, she was, while she's talking about pilgrimages, she said that one Vaishnav guru said that uh, he's not going to eat with uh, the, uh, the maid uh, because they were in a hurry to leave for the next place. And he said he's not going to have his food if the maid joins them. And then uh, when the women in the group decided uh, to have their food and leave him behind. Then he left his uh, all the protestations that he had against uh, uh, eating with somebody of a lower caste. So uh, they also make fun of uh, uh, all the uh, superficiality of the caste norms that were enforced on society. So uh, I think they did not. Uh, these women, uh, maybe one of the reasons that this is my reading absolutely was that this uh, low caste women were the ones with whom uh, these women who were restricted within the Ontopur were allowed to interact with because as domestic maids and uh, we also know, uh, also know that uh, Vaishnav women, they were allowed to come in and teach uh, these Hodramohila women. So uh, I think uh, that is why uh, they did not uh, believe in upholding the caste structure uh, as was necessary by the Bengali Potru. That, that's my reading, most probably. There's another question, Maruna, in the chat box. Yeah. Can you please uh, read it out? Because I'm having some problem. It's like... Uh, yes, of course. I can read it out. Yeah. Uh, how valuable are women's life writings, diaries as historical documents since they are also enmeshed in class caste structures of the time, exercise self-censorship, and are aware that the private writings are in the public domain once published? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that is a, a problem that plagues autobiography writing and diary, I think, because that might be uh, common even in present times as well, as to how much we would write, like to write. And considering the fact that uh, this 19th century and there are certain out of the Bhadra Mohila, uh, certain cultural norms that uh, wanted women to be invisible, I think uh, the pressure not to say all was much. That is why we find that Sharada Shundari made uh, her grandson-in-law uh, promise that uh, this dictated autobiography would not be published as long as she, uh, she's alive. So that too is there, but I think uh, Kulash Bashini's uh, diary is quite candid uh, because she is uh, talking about the fact that she's playing cards with uh, her husband and sort of uh, romantic uh, encounters uh, that she has. She writes everything down along with the fact that she, she was heavily disappointed uh, as uh, Kisharichad came to Calcutta and chose a life which was radical. So uh, she is open with her disapproval as well as uh, uh, what is basking in companionate love. It, it comes quite, uh, quite clearly. About Sharada Shundari, uh, that might be a bit of a problem because uh, I think she was at times trying to uh, protect uh, 
Keshav Chandra, uh, sorry, uh, Keshav Chandra Sen, uh, she like she did not uh, indulge much on Keshav Chandra Sen, but little that she did, I think she wanted to prove that uh, uh, Keshav Chandra did not move away from the Brahmo faith. Uh, sorry, uh, Vaishnava faith and the Vaishnava guru actually approved his uh, transition to Brahmo faith and things like that. So uh, I think uh, that is, but the fact that she was very critical about the um, marital home, about her uh, mother-in-law, about uh, her brother-in-law, the way he tried to take away all property and all, and how uh, it was not a blissful marriage and uh, the fact that she had, uh, she whatever happiness she had came out of widowhood because she was allowed to go away, go, go out of the household to visit various pilgrimage sites. So that that's quite, uh, I think, unusual. Like uh, uh, one can say that uh, she she actually uh, lived all the uh, what did I say? All the prescribed lives that a woman was allowed to live as a mother, as a daughter, and having realized how futile it is to uh, live according to prescribed norms, she breaks the uh, norm of silence and becomes critical of the uh, household because the household never ensured happiness to her, uh, though marriage was supposed to uh, lend just that to her. Thank you, Maruna. Uh, other questions? Okay, well, I don't see any. No, I do see one. Um, that is not a question. Uh, it's a thank you <laughs> uh, from Minakshi. So any more questions uh, from the audience? Okay, well, I see no more questions. Uh, so Maruna, I want to thank you very much for your very interesting and um, insightful uh, lecture. Um, and I, of course, want to thank the audience uh, for being there. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. For this talk. Thank you. Thank you.